Thank you so much, Priscilla. It's wonderful that you're all here, and we'll really kind of have an informal conversation. And, sure. uh, and then relatively soon, I want to kind of actually turn it over so we can really engage all of you. Um, so, uh, so as you're sitting there, think about uh, different questions that you might want to uh, pose as well to, to Delroy. And I only don't answer the smart questions. So. Exactly. <laughs> so, so think about it very clearly, because he will be stern. <laughs> I have experienced this. Uh, so uh, so um, I thought maybe it might be best to kind of start out uh, with a little bit of your background um, in terms of nationality, growing up, and uh, culturally. Uh, I think it often is the inspiration for how we express ourselves as, as artists. And, uh, and almost more recently, people kind of began to <coughs> describe a, you as a British actor or that you've mm. grown up in Britain or, mm. or raised kind of these ideas. Mm. And I was just wondering if you could share with everyone kind of that, that sense you had initially growing up in, in Britain and then coming to the States and how that kind of just informed a sense of identity. With the advent of, <coughs> excuse me, the Internet, and the fact that there are no, there's no privacy, there's no, there are no secrets anymore. Everybody knows everything, right? Um, yeah, it, it's in, it been in the last 10 years or so that this British actor thing has, has started to proliferate. <laughs> <coughs> um, and yes, I was, I was born in England. Uh, you know, I, I don't consider myself a British actor, actually, because the fact of the matter is my whole career has been here. And the irony, part of the irony of that is, and I'll talk about this a little later if, if it comes up, <laughs> there's no way in the world, there's no way in the world I could have had the career that I've had here in England for a whole variety of reasons. Um, having said that, Yes, I was born in England. Um, the reason I was born in England is because my mom, I am of Jamaican extraction. Any Jamaicans in the house? <laughs> yes, Dred. <All> right. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I'm of Jamaican extraction. Um, and my mother uh, was part of a whole movement of people from the Caribbean to the UK that started in the late 1940s and um, extended on through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, on into today. What is significant about that is that the arrival of these hundreds of thousands of Cur people from the Caribbean um, changed the definition of what it means to be British forever. The British, for their part, are still grappling with that. Um, However, my mom was part of that movement from the, Car from the Caribbean into the UK, uh, which is how I came to be born in England. Uh, my mom was a nurse. Uh, now, I'm not speaking about my father because my father um, really had nothing to do with raising me. Um, <clears throat> but my mom was a nurse. And um, eventually, my family uh, followed the kind of tried and true path of the of Caribbean immigrants, which is to England, to Canada, to the United States, and that pretty much has been my was my path. Um, so, from a cultural point of view. I think that the fact that throughout my whole life I moved around a lot. Coming to America uh, was one other move. And uh, while I don't mean to downplay that, could I get either a towel or uh, some napkins or something? Because I'm, I'm sweating. <laughs> and I don't want to take my coat off because I like this coat. <laughs> 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 These lights are intense. <laughs> Uh, um, it's a sweet jacket. 
It is sweet. That's why I'm wearing it. <laughs> That's why I don't want to take it off. Um, so com coming to America was, was, was one more move. Certainly there were cultural adjustments. And the fact of the matter is, in terms of my internal process, there are instances in which I am aware of my, Euro I become aware of my European background, just in terms of how my mind works. And I know somebody's going to ask me, what do you mean? And I, I don't know, I, I'll think of something if I get asked that question. But um, <laughs> certainly, my mind works in an in a odd way sometimes. Um, I remember the very, the very first time I went to Paris, which was not until 1993 I was in Paris. And my wife and I were walking down the street, and for some reason completely unbeknown to me, I felt comfortable there. Now, I'm not French, obviously, but the connection that I made was, oh, Europe. I, I don't feel out of place, necessarily. That was a, that was a aha moment, having to do with my awareness of my Europeanness. But to your original question about uh, I, essentially, I think of myself as an American actor um, because my whole career, my whole life has been here, and I never ever could have had a um, a career, the one I've had here, anywhere, frankly, but in the United States ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, but having said that, thank you so much. Having said that, um, certainly there have been adjustments mm -hmm. yeah. that I've had to make. Yeah. So initially growing up, kind of, you know, the whole question about, you know, the, the acting bug, kind of the initial yeah. passion, the initial love for what it is that we do. How did that come about for you? Literally, when I was five years old, um, I was in the nativity play in, in, in my elementary school. I played one of the kings, you know, <laughs> we three kings, oh boy. <laughs> and I believe that that's when I got the bug. Um, because, <clears throat> you know, v very soon thereafter, um, you know, when people would ask me, you know, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was always, I want to be an actor. Now, you know, I got laughed at. Um, I, I had no frame of reference for this. You know, none. I couldn't look at a relative who was an actor. I couldn't look at anybody who was a, a role model. Um, I think the experience of being in that, look, the experience of being in that play, I think what it did for me, and this is all, you know, retrospective. I, I've ne to deconstruct these things is sometimes difficult. However, what I remember about that experience, I remember my, my teacher the, who was, you know, directing the nativity play. I, I, I see her face, I don't remember her name, but she made a fuss about me. She said, oh, you're so good. Um, and, and our lines, uh, the dialogue, were on these car small, white, cardboard cards. And I think I, I may have mentioned this to you. Um, there was the young man who was playing King Herod. His name was Michael Penny. And he was having a heck of a time remembering the lines that were on this card. And at one point, the teacher said, do it like Delroy. Delroy is so good. <laughs> but it, it, it wasn't, but you, look, I have to say this. It wasn't, ooh, I'm so good. It wasn't that. It was, a, it, was an affirm, it was a certain affirmation for something that I was doing that made me feel different than any other thing that I did. Now, I, I, I do have to say this. I was a talented athlete. I played soccer as a, as a, as a, as a kid, and I was good. I was, I was very talented. So I was affirmed 
athletically, you know, I was a film when I played soccer and I did track and field, but this was a different kind of affirmation. And I think a more profound um, kind of affirmation. And in the face of various of the other challenges that faced me as a young black child in England, are there any Brits in the house? <laughs> are you from England? You're from Wales. You're from Wales. I don't know what your impression, your experience is, but, and I will say this, the British, the British form of racism is, while it is different than the American version, the British version is no less virulent in its own way and damaging for people who are subjected to it. So as a, as a young black child living in, going to all white schools, I was the only black child in my elementary school. And that connects to the, 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 the affirming the, that I received doing this, doing the nativity play. And various of the communities that I lived in and you know, I was subjected to stuff. So in any area in, in which I was affirmed meant a huge amount. Now I, I really want to stress, at the time I wasn't thinking like that, but I believe in retrospect, deconstructing and trying to identify the, the, when these seeds were planted, I believe it has to do with all of that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And when you think about even coming from that initial kind of, you know, childhood. I want to say something. Yeah. I, I talk a lot. Okay, so just. That wasn't going to be a good question, by the way. So. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. So look, if I talk too much, just do that. I want to say something about, about the UK and that whole experience. I, I got a master's degree from NYU in 2014. My degree, which started out as a screenplay about my mom's life, my degree became a research project because I did so much research uh, in support of this screenplay that I am writing and continuing to write my advisor very brilliantly at a certain point said, you know what, you have done so much work here, why don't you make your degree a research degree rather than a creative degree and um, you'll be out of here. And I said, yeah, that, that sounds good to me. The res my project traced the existence, the presence of African descended people in the geographical area that became the UK. This goes back to Roman times. I did not know that. Um, it traced the presence of African descended people in that geographical area that became the United Kingdom up through the Middle Ages, up through the 21st century. And it identified the evolution of racial and racist ideology in that area and how all of that affects the 21st century entertainment industry, right? So I hope you followed that. That was a mouthful. Yeah. But, but, but in, in, in tracing the presence of African-descended people and identifying these various um, moments in time in, in history and identifying the evolution of the racial and the racist ideology, Certain things became clear to me, it was extraordinary, there were certain things that became clear to me having to do with my own childhood and certain things that had happened to me and I looked back and I said, oh my God, that's what that was about. It was a stunning, stunning experience. Now one of the central pieces of literature that I, that I, that I um, uh, researched and read and studied is a book called Staying Power. 
Um, somebody get on their phone, because I know you're on your phones anyhow. <laughs> and look, I can never, and it happened to me yesterday, Peter, what's his name? Peter, his last name, I don't remember his, but the book is, is called Staying Power, um, basically which traces the history of African descended people in the UK. There is a, a very important period that exists in, 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 in British and world history, and it is called the Windrush period. You know about that. I didn't. I did not become aware of Windrush until 2000, the year 2000, when I went to England to do a film uh, in which I was playing a Jamaican, the patriarch, patriarch of a Jamaican family that moves next door to a Jewish family. And the film is all about the, what transpires as a result of these two families living side by side. Wondrous Oblivion. It's called Wondrous Oblivion. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you, you've seen it? Yes, I have. Ah, okay. <laughs> You're the only one that saw it. No, saw it. <laughs> oh, you saw it. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting film. I, want, I, 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 I agreed to do that film because it dealt with this period when my mom was just arriving in England. Now, I didn't. So in, 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 when I was researching, I came across, the producers gave me all this material to look at, and I came across all of this information that I had heretofore been completely unaware of. Windrush. The Empire Windrush was a boat that in June of 1948 took, I think, 300 Jamaican men from Jamaica to England. For some weird reason, there were these Jamaican men and 60 Polish women. I don't know how the Polish women got in there, but anyhow. Um, this began the epoch in British history that became, became known as the Windrush period. All of these people from the Caribbean who arrived there and the ensuing, um, uh, the hundreds of thousands of people from the Caribbean who followed them and their progeny became known as the Windrush Generation. Now this is critical to me because I was not aware of any of this until 2000. And in further uncovering this information in pursuit of my degree, it dawned on me that if the Windrush generation started in 1948 with the arrival of this boat, the Empire Windrush, and I was born in 1952, I was born right at the start of the Windrush generation. Oh my God! Which gave me a completely different um, understanding of myself, my own experiences as a young child, and of British history in general, because 1952 is six or seven years after the end of World War II, and the culture is changing dramatically. Many of the institutions, the cultural, inst the, the social institutions, are changing in England, and you throw into that mix the arrival of all these black people. It's going to be, it's going to be the, um, uh, what's the word? It's going to be the, um, oh, I'm blanking, the recipe for all kinds of things. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. So looking back, studying this stuff, and I remember some of the things that happened to me when I was four and five years old, some of the things that happened to my mom. I had a perspective. So you're talking about identity. Because all of that is, all of those things are recent discoveries for me, I am re-examining a number of things, a number of elements in terms of who I am on the planet. Who I am on the planet as an African descended person, specifically who I am on the planet as an African descended person who was born in England, etc, etc, etc.
That was a very long-winded answer to your question about identity. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> no, this is awesome. There is... I am so long-winded. <laughs> if, my, if my wife were here, she'd be saying... <laughs> Anyhow. <clears throat> so this window through which we can um, see how you kind of uh, have gone through this evolution of identity and, and understanding of yourself, to kind of shift a little to um, craft. When you look at a role and when you begin to take it on, can you kind of share just a little how you look at that, um, and especially for, for students, uh, what you think kind of the most valuable components are that you've brought to that process? That I will. My own personal opinion is that when you're examining a piece of work, now this is my own personal opinion, and different actors will tell you different things, and you should take a little bit of something from everybody. There's no one answer. But for me, I believe that when you take a piece of work, look for the elements in that material that you relate to, that mean something to you personally. Why do I say that? One of the most significant creative experiences that I have had as an actor came about when, there were two of them, there are a number of them, but there are two in particular. I played a character named Harold Loomis in a brilliant August Wilson play called Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Now, for all of you who are familiar with August Wilson, August Wilson, <coughs> an African-American writer, writing a play for each decade of the African American, I, I started to say African, experience in this country. He wrote a play for each decade. I believe that all of his plays are about the same thing, on some, broadly speaking, identity. African people, African descended people looking for themselves in this new world. That is very much what Joe Turner's Come and Gone is about. I played a man, Harold Loomis, who is looking for his wife. By extension, it's Harold Loomis looking for himself. It is referred to in the, in the play as finding your song. One of the other characters, Bynum, says, you're, you're looking for your song. Your song is in you. But he doesn't know that. I, I didn't know that. I, f I discover that throughout the course of the play. What? Now, I played Harold Loomis. And that play, I didn't realize it when I first started rehearsing it. But through the process of doing four different productions before we went to Broadway, I connected with that man and that play in a very personal way. And that is what caused me, allowed me to investigate that part, to present that part in the way that I was able to do it. And it remains um, among the th three or four most rewarding and successful um, outings for me as an actor. And it had to do with, and I remember exactly, I remember exactly when it happened. It was intermission, it was the first, my first, um, I didn't originate the part. Charles Dutton originated the part up at, up at Yale. Rock's, um, uh, Charles Dutton's um, film career was starting to take off, and so uh, he went to do a film, and Lloyd, Lloyd Richards, who was at that time the dean of the Yale School of Drama, called me, I'm giving you the truncated version, I went into the production with two weeks rehearsal. Two weeks rehearsal. I say that because Harold Loomis is one of the great classical parts. Nobody should do Harold Loomis on two weeks of rehearsal. <laughs> but I did because that's, that's, that's all of the time that we had. It was, I was in Boston 
at the Huntington Theater, the Huntington Hartford. It was a, it was either a Saturday or a, I think it was a Sunday matinee, intermission. And I was lying on my back in the dark backstage in the theater because um, Harold is described, he's a very solitary man. And I am also very solid. I'm, I tend to be somewhat of a solitary um, personality myself, so I connected to that also. But I was la laying on my back in the dark during intermission, and a light bulb went off. And all of a sudden, I knew exactly what my connection to this man was and what my connection to the play was. And I spent the next four productions refining and, and examining that for myself. And it was a very, it was something very, very personal. So, for all of you in the room, my op opinion is that you should, when you're examining material, start by looking for that which resonates for you personally and make that your foundation. Now, of course, there will be parts that you play that there are parts that you play that, that will not resonate, for, um, that, that will have elements of the character that you're playing that won't resonate for you. But if you start from the things that do resonate, the things that are personal to you, it will give you a foundation. And you can, you know, make up the rest. You can create the rest, which is what acting is. But I believe that the, the, the nut the foundation should be that which is personal. And that is what has worked for me in my career. And every single thing that I have done that has been successful has had an element of something or some things that I connected to personally. Walter Lee Younger, a, 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 one of the great plays, A Raisin in the Sun. <laughs> there, were, there, were, there were two things. The more obvious element has to do with the tension, the conflict with the mother, with mama. That was something I related to in terms of my, my relationship with my mother. But there's something else. There's another character in that play. The other character that's not present in that play is the dead father. Lloyd Richards told me that, and it was one of the greatest gifts. When he said that, of course, when I realized that, and, I, and, it, and it gave scope and magnitude to another component to Walter Lee's struggle, because not only is Walter Lee having to deal with his mom, and the manner in which he's in, a, he's in a household of women. And he's got his 12-year-old son watching him. And all of these women are telling him, no, you can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. His mother, his younger, younger sister, and his wife. And he's, in the, and he's got this 12-year-old boy looking at him. And Walter Lee has these dreams that he wants to make a reality. And everywhere he turns, he gets denied, denied, denied. And the shadow of his dead father is there. So in terms of the conflict existing between Walter Lee and his mom, I related to very directly the presence <laughs> The presence of an absent father, right? The presence of an absent father I related to, even though my circumstances with, with my father were very different. But those elements resonated for me very personally. And um, that became the foundation for my exploration of, of Walter Lee. Uh, I have to say, I said something to somebody recently. I was very fortunate. I got to play the part twice. The first time I played the part, I was not very good. There were various reasons why I was not very good. But then the second time at the Kennedy Center, 
Um, the first time up at Yale, I maybe achieved 65% of Walter Lee. Uh, the first time at Yale, 65%. When I had the opportunity to do it again, and I approached the whole process completely differently, I, I, I 85, 90, 93, and 94%. It was much more successful. So, again, another long-winded answer. Examine that which is personal to you. Start there. Start there. I don't and know what the still, question was. I, exactly. <laughs> and I'm still just contemplating the presence of an absent father. Uh, mm. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And um, medium. There is a hole. <laughs> There's a hole I became aware of some years ago of the hole that's at my center that represents the, my absent father. I don't know what that means other than I was aware of it and certain things made sense in terms of who I am and, 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 and how I am in the world. It's the, it's the presence of the absence of my father. One thing I can say from a practical standpoint, everything that my... Now, I knew who my father was. He came into my life. I saw my father probably, I don't know, seven times in my whole life. Every single time my father came into my life, it was about, it was a negative, a deeply negative experience. But the wonderful thing, the wonderful thing that my father gave me, he gave me a primer on, the, on what not to do with my own son. So thank you, Dad, for that. <laughs> Your question, sir. <laughs> so, um... Medium. So you've, you've had this opportunity to work on, on stage and on screen. Um, do you have a sense of a different approach um, to either do you find um, one to be more fulfilling than the other? Uh, what's your sense of the difference between those and how you approach them? That's a great question. Thank you. I can <laughs> <laughs> All of your questions have been great, Matt. Every last one of your questions is just um, I'm a I'm a theater person. I consider myself a theater actor. You know, that was my training, it was my birth as a as a as a creative person in the theater. And I've carried those things. Uh, the ethic that I established for myself as a as a theater actor. I have carried into my film work. Um, it's always difficult for me to compare the forms, theater or film, because they're both so powerful in their own, own right. I adore in the theater the connection between being up on stage and the dynamic that is established, the relationship that is established with the actor, um, with the actor and the audience. I love the breadth and the power of film. So, when those, when when, those, when they're working well, they each have a power and a resonance that is that one cannot. You, you, there's no value that one could put on it. How many actors in the room? Yeah. I, I don't want to talk for you guys, but, you know, our, our dirty little secret, actors, is that we do it for free. <laughs> we really would, you know. But don't tell anybody. That's our secret. <laughs> because of the, of the love that we have for this. And so the fact that we would do it for free then you, you get in a project, a play, that means something, that says something to an audience, that changes how people think. That is just icing on the cake. And then when you start working for the camera and one recognizes the breadth and the power that film has, you know, that is ex that's, that's just a, I can't, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. 
Uh, and I told, I think I told the story of the, um, when, I, when my wife and I were in Rome in 1997, and this Spanish man, we were walking down the street, and this Spanish, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Italian, Italian, walking down the street in Rome, and this Italian man says, Del Rolindo. <laughs> and I said, yeah, hey, how you doing? So he, didn't, he, couldn't, he didn't speak English, but he knew my name in the middle of Rome. That's the power of film. And I'm thinking, he's obviously seen something that has had enough of an impact that he remembered my name. That's the power of film. So it's always difficult for me to compare the two because they each have they're magical qualities, but I do consider myself a man of the theater, and the techniques that I developed for myself as a theater actor, I have modified, and I believe stand me in very good stead for my camera work. Of course, one has to make modifications. I'll give you one example. I arrived at a place as a theater actor, and it was actually when I was playing Harold Loomis. Big Broadway theater. The part has become, by the time I was in New York, the part, I was, I owned the part. I owned the part. And there were various internal processes going on that were informing how I was communicating with the other people in that play. And one night, somebody came backstage after, after the performance and said, she, she said to me, I was sitting in the back of the theater and I could feel you. I was sitting in the back of the theater and I could feel you, she said. What that affirmed for me in that moment is that whatever I was doing internally was transmitting to the back of a huge Broadway theater. When I started working for film, I sufficiently trusted my internal process. And I know, because the camera's right here. It's right here. You don't have to do it. If you think it, if you feel it internally, something will be transmitted to that camera, and the camera will pick it up. That's a very specific example of something that I took from the theater and has served me in film, the camera. Another thing, I had an extraordinary period of time in my life between 1986 in 1988. I got to play Walter Lee Younger twice, and I got to play Harold Loomis five times in the space of two years. These are big classical parts, Walter Lee Younger and Harold Loomis. It doesn't get any bigger than that. I will place those parts up against the Scottish King, uh, Othello, uh, um, Hamlet, any of the great parts, I will place those, those parts have, um, make the kinds of demands on an actor that those other big classical parts make. And I played Harold, uh, Harold Loomis five times between 1988, I'm sorry, 1986 and 1988, and I played Walter Lee Younger twice. Now, going back and forth between the parts, if I was going to survive, because they're huge parts vocally, emotionally, everything, how, how, how? So I developed a vocal warm-up that I did every single night when I was doing both Walter Lee Younger and Harold Loomis. I would get to the theater two and a half, three hours before half hour before half hour, and I would start my prep, <clears throat> my vocal and my physical warm-ups. 
I have taken those into my film because w what that did was I began the process of focusing on what I had to do in a couple of hours. And I still, no. Working for film, no, I don't get to the set three, two or three hours ahead of time. I don't do that. But what I do do is, do do, <laughs> is um, I have a set, when I'm working for the camera, I have a specific prep that I do either in my hotel room, my apartment, whatever, before I get to set. If there's time when I get on set, I do, I do it there. It's a physical and a vocal preparation, even for the camera. And that I developed working as a theater actor. So I know I want to be able to get to some of your questions. We're running short on time. Uh, one last just quick question that I wanted to, um, and I mean, we could spend a whole session kind of talking about the, um, uh, you know, uh, is there uh, prejudice, racism, obstacles in the field no. for actors of color? Kind of, <laughs> um, no. But but maybe if you could just comment on on in any aspect of that that you think is relevant for all of our students um, uh, uh, and how they might participate in the field. Um, whether of color or, or not. Sure. And maybe as part of that, um, if you could comment at all on, on the impact of any key experiences you had, yes. um, and especially potentially your trip with Danny Glover, Danny Glover to and South the Africa. others to South Africa. Yeah. Wow, yeah, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I do, and that is not answer the question. Go off on a tangent, then I'll come back and answer the question. Uh, be, are there any directors in the room? Ah, okay. I, I, there's something that c came up earlier, and I want to I want to say this to to the directors, and I'll perhaps in the in the um, class this afternoon. And for the actors, never always think about the physical aspect of what you're doing as a technique. Where is this character's center of gravity? How is that different from yours? How is this character that I'm playing, how is their body different than yours? How do they carry themselves that's different? How do they carry themselves that's similar? It, it occurred to me that physicality is um, a huge, it's hugely important to me. Um, and again, when I have been most successful as an actor, there's been some physical component that I connected to. And I really want, and I, I will get to your question, I promise. Um, the second time I played Walter Lee, the, it was directed by a, na a man named ha Harold Scott. We called him Hal, Hal Scott, who was, did you know Hal? Yeah, a, a, a very conflicted man, a very complicated man, but on his day, completely brilliant. And he gave me something, and he knew Lorraine. He knew Lorraine Hansberry. Um, they were actually very close. And um, is anybody in the room familiar with a Lorraine Hansberry play called Les Blancs? Les Blancs. Brilliant play, a wonderful play. The part of Eric in Les Blancs, Lorraine wrote the Hal Scott. They were that close. Lorraine, so Hal knew Lorraine and he gave me something as an actor when I was doing um, Walter Lee the second time. It was the figure eight. He said, um, let's make it, okay, eights. Walking in these figure eights, all right? Walking in these figure eights. So that when, when uh, Walter Lee is trying to express himself, he's walking in these figure eights. He's, Mama, you don't And all these people in this room, this house, are just are walking in these figure eights. And it, and it, I, 
don't know when he said it. I don't even I don't even remember how it came up in the rehearsal, but he said, "Just make these figures," and it became a, a really central physical component to my interpretation of that part. As Harold Loomis, now who in the room is familiar with the play? Okay, Harold, uh, Harold uh, Joe Turner's come and gone. All right. So this is a man who is, has um, experienced unspeakable degradation that is never actually identified per se in the play. So I had to, as an actor, fill in the blanks. And one of the things that I decided in, in playing Harold Loomis was that some of the degrad some of the violence that he had been that had been inflicted on him manifested in his body physically so it became this I, 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 My physical movement, my physical self in the play was very specific. My physical movement in A Raisin of the Sun, very specific. Harold Loomis, very specific. I am not saying for all the actors in the room that you will find those kinds of things that are really rich for you every single time you work. But I'm, I'm suggesting that you examine it for yourselves as actors. I'm really big on animal exercises. <laughs> um, so for the actors in the room and for the directors, the physical components are always important. Sometimes they will play a greater part in what you're doing than others. But make that for the actors and the directors. If you have time, make that part of your exploration when you're excavating work. Your question. <laughs> Racism. Um, all right. I, I wanted to say that because in a funny kind of way, that's more important than discussing. And I don't mean, your, I don't mean in terms of your question. It's a completely legitimate question. But of course there are obstacles. Um, specific to race, specific to gender. I think that, okay, and, and I'm not being smart. This is not a flippant. Who doesn't know that? Who doesn't know that there is the kind of racism and the kind of sexism? Who doesn't know that, that that exists in the industry? Raise your hand who doesn't know that. Okay, so if we all realize this, the job becomes how you are going to negotiate those things because those things are not going away anytime soon. So it's one of those things, and, and I'm not saying this is easy, of, I'm, I'm not saying that. This is, this is extremely challenging, upsetting soul-destroying in certain instances. But if you are going to act, if you're going to continue to create, it's very simple. You got to find a way around it. Or get out or stop doing it. So for those who, <coughs> excuse me, are going to have careers, are going to pursue what they want to pursue, the job becomes the job of circumventing, um, absorbing, but throwing, throwing it back off of you. I mean, these 
ugly and despicable elements. <clears throat> and working in Hollywood, what becomes very tricky is be sometimes it's very subtle, it's very nuanced. There, there are ways that they have of letting you know what your place is. If you force me to kind of deconstruct, I would say that my response, and I've made a lot of missteps in the face of those kinds of dynamics. I've made mistakes. But what I always have, what I always have in the final analysis, I have the fact that I have worked, that I've continued to work. I haven't always gotten the work that I wanted. Sometimes I, things have been kind of barren professionally, but I have continued to work and I've continued to get interesting enough work that it constituted an affirmation for who I am and what I do. And as long as I have that to hold on to, in the face of these slights, in the face of those obstacles, it is enough for me to continue my creative journey. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. The, trip I made, the trip I made to South Africa with Danny Glover that you, that you reference. And then we'll get to some and then, questions. All right. So, so briefly, we, we were in South Africa in 1994. It was a few weeks before the election. And, uh, and for everyone, this is the election. <laughs> oh, yeah, the election. Uh, Mr. Mandela, soon to be President Mandela, was, was, um, had recently been uh, freed from, 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 from Robben Island after 27 years. Um, and we went on this trip. Um, it was, it was a you know, fact-finding trip, um, voter registration. And something that I didn't say at SphinxCon that I'll say now, which connects to the, 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 the question about racism and how one responds to it. What we saw in South Africa, we were in uh, Joburg, Durban, and Cape Town eight-day trip seeing um, you know, regular people in Soweto and the various communities around Joburg. And one of the things that was, was, that was extraordinary doesn't, doesn't articulate the feeling, but there was, so, there was a lot of joy in the people. And for people to have been subjected to the kinds of degradation that they had been subjected to, there was so much joy. And in the final the, the day before we left, um, we were given uh, a, a, a dinner uh, by the ANC, African National Congress. We were hosted by them. President and soon to be President Mandela was there. I sat next to him. Um, what I one of the there are various things I remember from the, from, the, from the, it was a luncheon, but one of the things I remember very vividly was the amount of laughter and joy. And many of the people in that room had been subjected to unspeakable violations and they were joyful and they were grasping life. I, I could say a lot about that trip but I'll, I'll leave it there but as it relates to what you just asked me in the face of whatever kinds of obstacles and this sounds so cookie cutter but I, I think you know what I mean find your joy. Don't allow them to take your joy, to take your life, to take your verb, to take your... Because if you do that, then they've won. 
And I would say that in the face of um, my, my life as an actor and, and my continuing, uh, continuing career and, 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 and the, continue, the obstacles that continue to get placed in my way, and there are, sometimes they're larger, sometimes they're more subtle, but I consider that one of the most significant successes that I have had as an actor is that I'm still here. <laughs> Walking. Delroy Lindo. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to um, I'm I'm going to encourage I'm going to encourage uh, you all of you to um, uh, th there really are no silly questions. There really are no there are no silly questions. So if you if you if you're sitting on a question, you think oh, I'm not going to ask that. Ask it. So. All right. Please. Well, I would love to thank you for being here and thank for you. all of your work. You're like the guy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so there's a certain logic that says that based on the story you told about, you know, your first uh, acting in the nativity and blah, 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 and the affirmation that you were given, it could, you know, a certain logic could say, well, if you hadn't been, you know, isolated and, and, and you know, feeling an outsider, whatever, yes. whatever, then we wouldn't have this great actor. Yes. So talk a little bit more about the other things that happened between five and whatever that also supported your belief in yourself uh, to pursue acting. Wow. Good question. You know, wow. You know, one never thinks about some of these things until one is asked, right? I mean, one just kind of does one's life. I, okay, so I was five and I did the nativity play, and then I didn't actually start um, doing any work as an actor until I was 20-ish. And there were, I hope I'm answering your question, there were, there were always, okay, I did, one time I did this, um, it was um, poetry. Langston Hughes, that we, that the group of people I was working with presented in a, in a, in a, in a theatrical, in a theatrical way. We were taking the words and acting out the words of these poems. And I would say that even in an experience like that, it wasn't a real play there was enough of a positive response, even though I was untrained, I was completely untrained as an actor at that time. There was enough of a positive response, a thread of something that I held on to that got me to the next experience. And the next experience, there was a thread of something that I held on to. And then there was another thread until somebody said to me, you need to be trained. You need to go and train, you need to be trained as an actor. And that is when I went to AC, the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. The other thing, the other element, is that, okay, all right. I, <clears throat> as a young teenager, I made some bad choices, and uh, I ended up for a time in the system. In I was in what used to be called children's homes. I was taken from my mother, and I was placed in these homes.
because the state determined that, I, that my mother could not look after me. A very, 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 very uh, difficult time. What sustained me through that very difficult time was my dream of becoming an actor. So, so that was a thread. Now, you know, what's interesting, I, I wasn't thinking about it in those terms at the time, but I, I do remember, I'm going to be an actor. I'm, I'm going to be an actor. And people laughing at me, like, Ooh, I'm going to be an actor. I had this, I, this kind of vague notion that in the few, I was going to be an actor. It really did especially in the face of some of the more unfortunate things that happened to me, I, I had that, the dream of, 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 of becoming an actor. And I think I may have mentioned to you, oh God, I, I made some, I made, I, I did some dumb things, you know, as kids do. But the thing about the, some of the, some of the dumb things that I did, I could have been in jail. I could have been dead, and that's not hyperbole. I could have been dead. If, if the circumstances had gone that way, I would have been in jail or dead. But thank God they went that way. And part of the, some of the components that led the, the, the circumstances in this direction rather than that direction was, wait a minute, if I'm dead, I can't be an actor. And, and of course, I wasn't thinking like that, but it's like, no, I, I, want, I want this thing over here. I'm so when I say, and I think I may have said this also at Sphinx Khan, when I say acting saved my life, I mean that literally and figuratively. Does that kind of sort of answer your question? Mm, kind of sort of. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Another question. Great question. Yeah. So just backing off on your Jamaican background, I also have a Jamaican background, yes. but I was also born and raised in the Bahamas and then moved to America. So I think for me as a black actor and not necessarily an African-American actor, it's very hard to find an identity. Yes. Um, and I just want to know, like, how do you do that coming from so many different cultures and then also trying yes. to become an African-American actor in certain interviews? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think of it as becoming an African-American actor. I certainly understand the disconnect. All I can tell you is I think what I have done, I make the broadest, deepest attempt that I can to examine and research whichever character I am playing. And that helps me to take ownership. I'll give you an example. The first time I played Walter Lee, one of the reasons that I was less successful, I, I, I couldn't adequately bridge that disconnect that I felt in my head and in my body. I, I was, I, I, and, it, and it ultimately translated in my head to, you don't deserve to be playing this part. What are you doing? This, this, what are you doing? And I couldn't, I couldn't break that tape in my head and in my body. The second time I played Walter Lee, I approached it completely differently. I, um, I went to Chicago. Uh, through a friend of a friend, I, well, I researched. I engaged a, a lot of research. I spent time with um, a man named Oscar Brown, Jr. Oh. From Chicago. Oscar Brown, Jr. The, the best. <laughs> Oscar Brown, Jr. invited me to his home. I know, right? And he sat with me, and he just schooled me. He just he, he 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 told me about what life was like in Chicago in the late fifties. We just sat and we talked and we talked and we talked and we talked. And I made notes and I made notes and I made notes. And I think that this is Oscar Brown Jr. was one of the great cultural um, 
and he just, I sat at his feet, okay? I then, um, I then, um, <clears throat> I found out where Lorraine, I went to Lorraine's house, Lorraine Hansberry's house. I walked the streets of that neighborhood. And my hope was that somehow by osmosis, I would absorb into me something of the reality of 1950s Chicago. And that gave me a confidence. So that when I approached the part the second time, I had the experience of having played the part the first time, knowing what worked, what didn't work, but I also had the research. So that I had engaged in how it had, how it had influenced who I became in that part. So I would say to you, each part that you engage, don't think, how do I become an African American? Because you're immediately setting yourself up as a, there's a distance between you and it, and you and that person, that thing. Who is this human being, and what do I do to discover, to find out everything I can find out about this human being, and see if that. For me, it's been research. I write biographies for the characters I'm playing if they don't exist. Um, I just do the research. And that has, been, that has helped me in terms, of, in terms of bridging whatever gaps. When I was playing Harold Loomis, Harold Loomis was from Memphis. I went to Memphis. And I was very fortunate. And this is what God will do for you. This is what, this is what will happen. When you start to make those kinds of um, uh, when you kind of reach out that, that way, circumstances, circumstances will conspire to give you these little pearls, these gifts. In my case, when, when I went to uh, Memphis, right next door to the hotel I was staying in happened to be these two African-American women, these two sisters, biological sisters, who ran a tour, they had a tour company. But their tours were of unseen Memphis. <laughs> yes, I went to the Lorraine uh, uh, Hotel, um, but they also took me to, we went, I got in their car and they, we, we went way out, and there was a, we were in this field, and they said, look over there, and behind this tree was a shack. That was the slave quarters right there. It was, it was decrepit, crumbling, but they gave me those kinds of things. Um, they took me, I went, uh, I ran out of car, and um, I drove for about a half hour, 35, 40 minutes outside of Memphis, and I came to this area, and there was this red clay. Uh -huh. I parked the car, and I just walked on this red clay. Just walked. The red clay that was outside of Memphis reminded me of the red clay in parts of Jamaica. So that was my was a personal connection. Gave me ownership. And I absorbed as much of, as I could of Memphis. Certainly when I was walking on that red clay, I could believe that Harold Loomis walked that red clay dirt road. This woman said to me, <laughs> um, she, uh, um, sister said to me, I saw, I saw your Harold Loomis. I said, oh, I really dug it. She said, I ain't never seen a man walk in brogans the way you walked in those brogans. <laughs> <laughs> these, these small pearls of, <laughs> that's nice when you know you got it, these little details that resonate for your audience. So, research, just as much as you can get your hands on, as deeply as you can investigate it, and hopefully that will help bridge whatever gaps. That's what's worked. That's one of the things that's worked for me. Does that make sense? So I think we have just time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yes. When they play the World Cup, who do you root for? <laughs> <laughs> great question. <laughs> you know what? That's a great question. Um, England and the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they played a few. Yeah, they played and I was stunned, man, when that... Was it Clint Dempsey who scored that goal and, and Robert, what's his name, well, fumbled yeah, the ball? Fumbled the ball, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was on the treadmill. 
And I was, whoa! Okay, all right then. I mean, so it, it's, it's, it's bifurcated, but I would say England and the U.S. <laughs> and maybe just one uh, last thing. Any um, last sense that you would you know, want our students to have kind of moving forward yes. if there's kind of, yeah, I mean, there's so many components to there are so building many components. a successful career. But if you could pull one you'd want to leave them with. Okay, sure. You got to, this is so elementary, such an elementary thing to say, but um, you've got to develop the muscle. You got to learn how to take rejection. I know that's an, perhaps an obvious thing to say, but rejection comes in so many forms large ones, small ones, but the muscle that you have to develop to withstand that, um, I would say that that will be one of the main things that allows you to continue your careers because you're going to hear no a lot. You've got to have that muscle that says yes, say yes to yourselves. And sometimes it's completely schizophrenic because when, when everybody's saying no, You've got to say yes. And I know that it is, you know, a cliche. It is a, it's a huge cliche, but it's kind of sort of not personal. I mean, it is because it involves <laughs> you, but it's not in as much as they're looking for some other thing. And sometimes the reasons that they're looking for some other thing are completely external. They have nothing to do with who you are as a creative person, nothing to do with who you are as an actor. And when you start, and I said this yesterday, when you start to work in TV, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Because TV is controlled by advertising and the studios are packaging these, this product that has to appeal to the advertisers they package, they inhabit their product with people who look a certain way. And all you have to do is cut your TV on and you'll see who those people are. And sometimes those people who look a certain way simply cannot act. But, but guess what? That's not the point. It's the package, it's the look, it's that which the advertisers are responding to that which the audiences are responding to. Now, that has been a huge lesson for me to, le to learn, and I'm still learning it, particularly in television. <clears throat> because for me, what that has meant, how that has manifested in my own life and career, is that when I have been hired in television, since I'm not coming to TV off the back of a huge movie hit, things would be different if that were the case. That has not been the case for me. I get hired because I'm a good actor, I'm a solid actor, I'll bring gravitas to the project, right? All these things, and I don't, I don't mean to bemoan those things, because those things are important, but in, in terms of that paradigm, that TV paradigm, in the final analysis, the gravitas and the, uh, the you're a good actor and you bring substance and you bring weight and blah, blah, in the final analysis, that's not the ultimate um, focus of the thing that I'm in. And by the way, they'll give you the money also. We'll pay you X. Oh, you're going to pay me that? That must mean you value me in a certain way. Doesn't, it's, not linear, it's, not a, it's not a linear connection. It just means they want you in the project. But understand that the ultimate focus is elsewhere. And sometimes the ultimate focus is on usually young, younger people, a blonde. Sarah Paulson, I was listening to a, 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 an interview with Sarah Paulson. You, you guys know who Sarah Paulson yeah. is? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you guys heard this interview. It was on NPR. Yeah. And she said that any time she is offered a part in which she is going to be the lead, the producers ask her to dye her hair blonde. Uh, yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's usually a blonde and um, a certain look. And then the, the, the young male, the young male lead has a certain look, and sometimes they can act and sometimes they can't, and it doesn't matter, because that is, they are the components they need for this paradigm in television. And what I have had to come to terms with is, and that is not to disparage blondes, by the way, okay? No, I, I, I'm, I'm serious, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> I was blonde when I had hair. 
Um, what I've had to come to terms with is, is, oh, this is the reality of the world that I'm working in, if I'm working in television. And what I have to do in the face of that, and sometimes it's excruciatingly painful. It's excruciatingly frustrating. But what I have to do is rely on my training, my ethic, and do the work. Whatever they put in front of me, I will approach it as I would Shakespeare. And I'm not being facetious. You can never, ever, ever look down on the work that you're doing. Find a way to take it seriously and do your job. And sometimes it's hard because you just want to just throw your hands up. So, oh, what the, what is <laughs> Don't do it. Don't fall into that trap. Do your job at all times. Great. And if I can just add on to that as we thank Delroy oh, yeah. for, his, for his time with us here today, that I think it's that approach, that excellence of his craft that does lead to longevity yes. in the field. Yes. And Absolutely. leads to the type of just tremendous life that you're able to lead in our art form. So thank you. And I will say that a, a, a further component of that are, is coming to a place like this and being embraced in the way that you guys embrace me and being responded to um, genuinely, authentically for what I have done, you know, for my work, and that, talk about affirming, it doesn't, it doesn't get any more affirming than that. And I, and I remember, I may have told this story at Sphinx Con, when my career was just starting, I hadn't done anything, and I was, I was um, uh, sitting with a casting, some casting director, and she said to me, so, you know, where do you want to be in five, ten years? What, what do you see for yourself? And I said, well, you know, I, I just, I, wa I want to be respected for my work as an actor. And she kind of sneered and she said, yeah, right, yeah, you and the rest of the world. And she didn't say that, but that was the, the look. Yeah, okay. You know, you couldn't come up with anything more. But that's what I've gotten. And by the way, I get as much out of this as you guys do, trust me. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.